Welcome. Thank you, Lorna. It's always nice to start with a song. Okay. So, um, what is music therapy? Anybody, just show of hands, who's heard of music therapy in this room? Yay. Yay. Good. How many have worked with a music therapist or received services for music therapy? Good. All right. Great. Um, so really quickly, what is music therapy? We are an established healthcare field, um, and we work through building therapeutic relationships with our clients on um, reaching non-musical goals. So that could be working on depression, it could be working on coping, um, memory skills, depends on what population we're working with. So we can reach many, many different goals just using music. Uh, who benefits? Everybody. That's the great thing about music therapy. Um, we can work with really anybody um, and anywhere. So you'll find us in schools. You'll find us um, in assisted living centers. You'll find us working in hospice and hospitals, um, uh, mental health, behavioral health facilities. We have private practices. We can work anywhere. So it's really, really great. Uh, when did music therapy begin? Does anybody know this? Anybody know? <laughs> um, huh? At the end, yeah, at the end, after World War II, there were soldiers, and they were in the hospitals, and there were musicians coming in to sing with them and help, just help them relax, try to ease their pain. And um, more and more of these musicians were being requested. And so because the demand was so high, they finally decided, you know what, we need to make this a, a degree program. We need to train these musicians so they know um, all about the different illnesses and diseases and then how to use music um, to best um, improve the side effects or just maintain the side effects from those illnesses. And so I believe, was it 1955? was the first degree program. Um, the one here at Florida State is one of the oldest degree programs in the country. And so that's where it started. It started kind of behavioral health um, and just moved out from there. And so we're pretty much everywhere now. Why does it work? <laughs> Why does music therapy work? I think because we use, I think the it for music therapy is because we use the music that people prefer. So how many people have heard uh, I think the best way to help everybody to relax to music is to listen to classical music, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Which some people in here, that may be your music that you like to relax to, or that may be your favorite music, and that's great. But for everybody, I think everybody, our music preferences in here are probably pretty varied, Um what works for somebody over here is not going to be the preference of somebody over here. So we always use what the client prefers, whether it's country, rock, <laughs> rap, jazz, classical, whatever it is. Um, that's what we're going to use. And I think that's why we're able to connect with so many clients, because we use the music that's special to them. Right. Yes, thank you. Um, so having said that, it's extremely adaptable. We can adapt the music. We can make it as complex, as simple as we need to. Um, it <laughs> provides many opportunities for interaction. So we can bring many different groups together that you wouldn't think through the music. Um, people that normally wouldn't be active in the music. Um, so a lot of great things happen when we are working with our patients. Uh, it provides support. It provides structure within the session. Um, it allows the patients to be, or the clients to be successful, no matter what the functioning level is of that patient. We can always find ways to help our clients be successful in the music. Um, we will use a variety of interventions depending on what our goal is. But one of the main um, one of the main things is that we usually always use live music. Um, there are some instances that we do use recorded music, but a lot of times we use live music. I mean, can you think of being at a concert or a live music event and how ready 
at that moment, you're already so much more engaged because the music is live, right? If you want to sing, you're in it. Whereas if we turn on the radio and we're listening to the radio, it's easy to just lose track and think of something else, and pretty soon you forget that the radio is even on. So when the music is live, we're able to engage our clients much more, and we can do music made, live music making, we can do songwriting, we can discuss song lyrics, um, memories, and so there's so many, many great things we can do in the music. And we always pay attention, um, again, to the preference of the patient. Um, we can adapt the tempo, the style of the music to whatever um, our goal is at the moment. So if the patient is in a lot of pain, we might use softer, slower music. Or if you know we're really happy, we're trying to get everybody moving, we're going to use fast, up-tempo mu- mu- music. But it's always going to be based on what those clients or that group likes, right? Okay. All right. (laughs) One really cool thing about music therapy is that we can use music to address so many things simultaneously. And we're actually really working really hard, but we do it under the guise of having a lot of fun. And one way that this happens is through um, an intergenerational choir or an intergenerational rock band, depending on where you may be. Here in Tallahassee, um, under the directorship of Dr. Alizan Darrow, there is an intergenerational rock band that happens every spring. I see two of our members walking in the back um, at this moment. There's Jean. And what this allows us to do is we all get together. Uh, we meet at Allegro Senior Living Facility. It's the Allegro residents and FSU students together. And we rock out twice a week. We do everything from, you know, Daisy Daisy to Leonard Skinnerd. Um, so it's a really enjoyable experience. It addresses a lot of things at the same time. I'm going to show you a real quick clip. Because uh, like Amy always says that I appreciate, sometimes the best way to understand music therapy is to see music therapy. So let me show this to you. It is the concert event rock and roll fans have dreamed of their entire lives. Ow! Darling, you've got to let me know. Should I stay or should I go? There's about seven or so new songs that I want to take a look at. I feel good. Nice. 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 Singing does, does a lot to your whole body. It's got a lot of life. That's what we have, a lot of life. 2024 hours ago, I want to be singing. While Jack is sitting here, we have the possibility that he'll pass a kidney stone for us today. <laughs> Very warm, enthusiastic welcome to the young at heart. Experience the film that brought audiences to their feet with spontaneous applause at the Los Angeles Film Festival. This is the best performance I've ever seen in my life. Should I give it the gas? They're the rebels, the wild ones, who showed the world they can learn the whole song. I know we can, can. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, can, can. That's hard. From Fox Searchlight, the studio that brought you groundbreaking comedies like Sideways, The Full Monty, and Little Miss Sunshine. Oh, yes, and no, and, 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 comes an event 80 years in the making. Yeah. Young at heart. I think I can, 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 I think I can, can, if I want, I can, can, think I can, yes, I can, yes, I can, I know darn well I can, yes, I can, can. Okay, so can, would anybody be willing to just yell out at me, what are some kind of therapeutic benefits going on in that environment? Longs, lots of singing. You got to use those longs to sing. Absolutely. Because if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So they say, I'll agree. I'll support that. Yeah, a lot of, lots of, 
major cognitive exercise going on there, memorizing those words. And the director was pretty adamant about that. He's, if you ever see the documentary, he's feisty. He doesn't let them get away with anything. Joy and happiness goes such a long way, doesn't it? Yeah, having people, just giving people a reason to get out and about and to just be moving just because of the necessity to get somewhere. Absolutely. I, I would suggest that everybody in that group had a lot of meaning. What they do, were doing was really important. They were not only giving themselves joy, they were bringing joy to other people, which is also absolutely wonderful. What else did you see? Purpose, yes. We all need meaning in life. That's so valuable, isn't it? And you're caregivers, so you all know what you all give a lot, have a lot of meaning and give a lot of meaning to life. Yes. Everybody's nice to each other, which is crucial. Yeah. Maybe we'll be nice to each other all day today, too. Excellent. Those are all wonderful observations. So that's a documentary. It's called Young at Heart. Uh, the organization I was mentioning that Dr. Darrow directs, um, this is her choir. So a lot of the same ideas as Young at Heart. What was an added kind of element to that choir as opposed to the Young at Heart? Yeah, lots of dancing, costumes, and the interaction with younger people. A lot of those college students never in a million years would have had the honor and pleasure to hang out with the adults at Allegro. And it is so much fun because the students... Um, I think by the end of it, probably look forward to it even more than the older adults do. But there's just so many wonderful opportunities for interaction, maybe changing some perceptions on, on both sides. And what I love the most about it is um, I, I remember one of the older adults at Allegro just said she missed opportunities to have conversation. And for us, conversation is very simple. But for other people who don't have it as much or may have some cognitive decline, it takes a lot more work um, to listen, to receive the information, to have a response, and to give it back to the listener. Um, so it gives them some really meaningful and important opportunities to do that also. <coughs> So that's just our choir being crazy as usual. Okay. Okay. So um, just to kind of hit on some points that I did earlier now that you've seen the clips. So we take many um, aspects into mind when we're using the music. So the age, um, culture, if they've had any prior involvement with the music. Right? That's really important. So we can incorporate that into our sessions and whatever we're doing. Um, and then there is a, is that next, the ISO principle? Say again. The ISO principle slide. Okay, we'll get there. There, One of the things that we use in music therapy is called ISO principle. And pretty much it's just using the music to match where our clients are. So 
How many people in here, when you're really, really sad, you go turn on a really, really happy song? Okay, a few of you. How many of you go turn on sad music? Yes. <laughs> right? So that's, that's pretty much the ISO principle. We're going to match the patient where they're at. Um, and then we slowly use the music. We'll either get faster if we need them to get more motivated, engaged, and um, interactive, or if we need them to relax, we may slowly bring the music down. Um, and so you're going to see that here in a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, music to change mood, right? I think we've all experienced that in this room. Um, but when we're talking with using music with um, our clients with Alzheimer's dementia, we can work on goals such as decreasing agitation, um, wandering, improving sleep, reducing anxiety, just through using preferred music, active music making, using the ISO principle, we can um, approach these goals. And so ISO principle, like I just explained, active music ma making, providing structure. And so like I said, we structure the music so the patient or our clients can be successful at whatever goal we're trying to reach. So if we're working on memory or problem solving or relaxation or agitation, um, we do structure the music to help them have success. Um, even just simply singing to a CD, right? The act of singing relax releases endorphins. Active music making releases endorphins. And that's going to work to improve your mood, engagement in the music, and then just exercising to music. We found, even our research literature, but we can see it when we are working with our patients that even when we have them engaged in music, um, when we're dancing to music, or we may even actually be working on rehab <laughs> exercises, so if we're working on arm movements, leg movements, stuff like that, when we add the music, they are actually able to go a lot longer. And I think that's true for a lot of us. I know I don't run very far if I don't have music, right? But you turn on your music and you can go a lot farther. And so that's a good thing about music. When everybody gets involved, um, I think we can all do a lot more when the music is there. And the principal is next. Okay. okay. So Lorna is going to give us a good example of ice principle. I hope so. <laughs> There's also this idea, it's called the preference theory. Um, going back to listening to music that we enjoy, that's the most effective. I've often worked with patients who have dementia or Alzheimer's, and I'm, they may not be able to tell me what kind of music that they like the most. If there's a family member close by or a loved one or someone who can give me that information, that's fantastic. But if that's not the case, which it usually is, the preference theory is something that I always take into consideration. And that states that usually... We form a lot of our preferences in general, not just musically, um, but a lot of our, our tastes and preferences, usually be, the theory says between 18 and 25. So think to yourself and kind of give me a clue. The music that you liked during kind of that age range, is that the music that you prefer now? Is it? No, it's not for me. And there are a lot of people who, you know, question kind of that, that idea, and that's okay. Um, I'm 38, and the music that was popular when I was in my 20s was like LL Cool J, salt and Peppa, um, Whitney Houston, which I actually like Whitney Houston. Yes, I got a supporter out there. Um, so I hope that my music therapist doesn't start rapping for me because that's wonderful music, and I give it a lot of credibility, but it's just not what I prefer. I love music from the 30s and 40s, and who knows who knows why? It's probably what my parents listened to in the car when they drove me around. So if you don't know, that's generally kind of a safe place to start. It's kind of, is that music kind of in, in that time period when you're in your, in your early 20s? So I'm going to demonstrate now for you kind of an example of an ISO principle. The ISO principle works both ways. If someone's really calm and we want to wake them up a little bit, we would start fast and kick things up a notch. If someone's maybe agitated or really excited and we want them to calm down, uh, we would meet, start where they are, which would be a little uh, fast, up-tempo music, and, and slow it down. Sometimes it takes 10 minutes. Sometimes it takes 45 minutes. Um, today, y'all are going to go on my schedule. So it's just, I'm just going to give you a little sampling of it. So be mindful of all the musical elements that you might hear. Okay. And you're always welcome to sing along. Mm -hmm. 
second verse to that song I'll share it with you you'll like it Thank you. 
So what did you notice about the songs from the beginning to the end? They got a lot faster. Say again? Yeah, more, much more lively. And maybe some, of, I started out picking the guitar, just individual strings, and by the end we were strumming, had a little hand percussion. Um, from my point of view, I saw a lot more movement toward the end, um, people tapping their toes, just kind of moving their bodies to the beat. At the beginning, I have a feeling some of those songs were very sentimental to some of you, um, as they are to many of us. Did that bring back any associations for you? Anyone, any song in particular? Just about all of them. I hope they were all happy, pleasant, positive memories. Music has such a way of just taking us right back to a place very quickly. So that's an example of the ISA principle going up. So I hope it helps some of you kind of maybe wake up a little bit this morning. <laughs> if you weren't already. Okay. <laughs> Do you like my squirrel? <laughs> I've been waiting a long time to use that meme. If you don't know, that's a meme. It's a picture with a little phrase on it, if you didn't know what that meant. I find myself getting um, behind in technology, so I like to pass on whatever information I have. So we use music a lot to improve psychosocial issues. Um, music just makes us happy, like we saw in the Young at Heart and the Intergenerational Rock Band. Um, it gives us an opportunity to go out and be social and to be with other people. Um, one of my favorite professors here at FSU, um, his name is Dr. Dan Barato. He was in the psychology department. And one of his phrases that he often used that I always remember is the opposite of depression is participation. I'm not sure there's clinical research to back that up, but, you know, I'll go with it. I think that's a pretty fair statement. Sometimes we are, we're tempted to stay home, and if we don't have a reason to get out and be about and be with other people, um, it kind of just make, worsens the, the problem. So going out and being with others, especially under the guise of music, that's such a group um, intervention, is just really lovely and effective. Amy mentioned earlier, we talk about active music making, whether it's singing, um, playing the piano, playing a guitar. You'd be amazed at how much you can do with a musical instrument, even if you've never picked it up before. We music therapists have a lot of really great tricks up our sleeves, and we can um, structure things such that those who may have never held a guitar in their life can play a very simple song very quickly, and that's really exciting. Songwriting also, for some people, can seem like a really um, overwhelming uh, um, task to take on. But again, music therapists have wonderful techniques and ways to engage people in a songwriting activity that we can do very efficiently and very meaningfully. And it's so wonderful for people to be able to write songs, um, either to express themselves or to share with other people. Um, it's also another really meaningful um, intervention that we do. And reminiscence. Uh, we probably could have spent 20 minutes just reminiscing about the songs, uh, the memories that those songs brought back to us that, that we just shared together. So that's also a really powerful aspect of, of music. 
Amy mentioned music and um, exercise, which leads me to talk about music and movement. It's one aspect of music that I really love. Um, I enjoy being as active as I possibly can um, and very grateful uh, for my body that it is working well so far. Um, so M Amy mentioned music and exercise compliance. That's a very strong motivation to get people to engage um, because whatever sort of exercise regimen you've been given, it doesn't really matter if you don't do it. And music is a wonderful way to encourage people to, to keep moving. I enjoy working with individuals who have issues with um, gait. Um, I really enjoy working with um, the um, Parkinson's um, population for lots of reasons. In the past, um, gait performance can be an issue um, for that population. Um, and I always found it really fascinating how music can really enhance mobility. So I'm going to share this short clip with you just as an example of, of how music offers entrainment within the body. And just by watching, um, it will exemplify what I'm talking about. This is called rhythmic auditory stimulation. So the first time you see the gentleman walking into his apartment, it's just without any music, that's probably just his general mobility. And you might describe it as, I would say, maybe a little sloppy, very unintentional. Um, as a person who's worked in hospice for a long time, I saw all those rugs on the floor, and I thought, those rugs have got to go. Lots of tripping and lots of opportunities for, for falling, and we don't want that. Second time around, he had, um, it was his preferred music, um, something he really enjoyed, a familiar melody. It was also live. There is an individual playing piano in the background. Another benefit of live music is we can really tailor it to whatever it is we're doing. If you wanted someone to walk faster, we would just begin increasing the tempo. And I'm going to guess that you probably watched him walk in with that music and his walking was very different. It was much more intentional. It was much more even, and it was much more steady. The third time he walked through without anything, it was still a positive gait um, very intention to focus. I wasn't um, as concerned for him the third time through as I was the first. So it was just an example of how that music can carry over into enhancing gait performance. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, music therapy to increase bonding between the caregiver and their loved one. Um, I did this a lot when I worked at the hospital. We would get referrals all the time because the family wanted music therapy to come in. And, um, and it was for patients at all stages of um, Alzheimer's disease. And so sometimes it was I would go in and we would all just sing songs that that um, patient knew and the family would sing and we would all sing. And it really provided a nice moment, right? We're in the hospital, but you could tell it, that moment kind of took them outside those walls of that hospital. And so they had that moment um, of bonding. And then there would be other times where I would have a patient that was pretty far along um, in the, the disease process, and the family wanted music therapy to come in just to see, just to see, can, will they move to the music? Will they look at us? What will happen? Um, and I loved, I loved all of those patients because I would always, we would always see something, right? Um, 
I can count many times where I've had a patient. I walk in, and the family's sitting there next to the bed, and um, they would tell me, yeah, this is what um, this is what he or she likes. And so I would start playing music, and either their eyes would open, or you would see, like, the hand kind of move. Or there was always some kind of response. And so music has that ability to provide those really special moments between the family um, and their loved one. Um, By using um, familiar music, like we've talked about, um, not only increasing um, meaningful interactions, but increasing quality of life. Um, For the caregiver, there are ways that you can use music to decrease all that stress and um, intense emotions that you may feel. Um, So there's many ways that music therapy can help, not only the bonding, but the caregiver themselves. Um, And we can do this through songwriting. I've done a lot of sessions where I've worked with the family, where they're writing a song for their loved one, or I'm working with a loved one and we're writing a song for the family. Okay, and we're putting favorite memories in there and all that good stuff. Um, So those can be very powerful. Dancing. I've had family members dance with their loved ones, right? And so we'll play those songs that they used to dance to. Um, And they're dancing together, standing up, or they're dancing in the chair, but they're having that moment. Playing instruments together, um, singing songs. Um, And so those are just some of the ways that music therapy can help build that relationship. Um, between the caregiver uh, and their loved one. All right. Do you want to? Sure. Not only are there opportunities for caregiver bonding with the patient, but also for individuals who work in um, facilities or wherever you may be. If you're a, a if you work for hospice and you have the honor of traveling around a lot, there are great opportunities for that interaction as well. I love to use music as a as a cue. Every time a certain song comes on, is it, it's time for such and such. Um, using music, for those people who work in, in facilities, utilize your music therapist if you have them in your facility. A lot of times giving baths for people who have dementia or Alzheimer's can be a really, um, that can be really hard. It's a very, it can be a very frustrating process. And so music is a great way. You bring that music therapist right in that shower room with you, and that sh- therapist will sing along Um, and provide the appropriate music, whether it's fast or slow, depending on what we want. And that can make the experience so much more pleasant, not only for the person receiving services, but for the CNA who's giving the bath. Um, I always joke that I've taken showers with a lot of strangers. Um, I've been in many shower rooms with lots of different people playing along. Uh, So that's a wonderful um, opportunity, too, for kind of this more positive um, environment for something that could be... could be really stressful. I think it's great too. Um, I I used to put lists of songs, you know, in a lot of facilities, there's usually a bulletin board or something up behind the bed. Make a list of songs, even for your loved one, and put them up there um, so people know what they enjoy. And those songs can be shared with the patient even when you're not there. And that can provide a really familiar environment um, in an otherwise possibly unfamiliar place. And that can be terribly valuable. Even putting songs on a a CD or a tape for them to listen to when that person isn't there is is also wonderful. It's a that's a very appropriate place for recorded music um, that can really cause, cause people to come to life um, and provide, provide them comfort. I love the poem that you shared earlier about um, someone being very fearful from being in a, an unfamiliar place. Okay. Um, these are just some images of things I wanted to share with you. On the big picture on the left, Music Therapy and Geriatric Populations is the book by um, Dr. Darrow and her colleagues. And what I am mentioning this book to you for is at the back, there are a lot of um, ideas and um, interventions for using music. And she 
lists all of them in a different way. If you're a music therapist, if you're um, working in a facility, or if you're a family member, three different versions of kind of the same intervention to use with your loved one. So if you ever get stuck and you need an idea, this is a really, really wonderful resource. It also has some good, uh, well, it has a lot of great research information in it too, if that's interesting to you. On the top right um, is a picture of a DVD. This is a documentary. It's called Age of Champions. It focuses more just on on wellness and older adults and staying active no matter what your level of mobility is. And it features three or, three or five different stories of individuals who are participating in the Senior Olympics. And they're a rowdy bunch of people. And what I learned from watching this documentary is that you're never too old or young to be competitive. So it's if you have an opportunity to see it, I recommend it. And the very last one there, Andrew Jenks, Room 335. Um, is a documentary made by a 19-year-old from, I think he's from New York or New Jersey. And for his final class project, he um, goes and lives in a senior living facility in South Florida. Um, he called several facilities and asked which ones of them would allow him to come live there for a summer. And he finally finds one that says yes. And he moves right in and lives there for three months. And it the film follows him around and his interaction with um, just the people that are there and the wonderful relationships that, that they establish over the summer. It's, a re it's, it's really endearing. Um, so, again, if you ever come across it, take advantage of that. Are there any questions or comments? Anybody have any experiences with music therapists, good ones that they want to share? Um, anything that we said that caused you to have a question? Be happy to talk about any of that. Yes, ma'am. His name is Dan Barato, B O R O T O. He was in the um, Department of Psychology. I believe he's not teaching here anymore, but um, he was really memorable. His other saying that he always said that I loved was the grass isn't greener on the other side, it's greener where you water it. I like that one. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just going to say, um, I'm the director of the adult day care facility in town, and we have a really good relationship. Yes. With yes. Big, big and we have, um, you know, clients on the parenting scale, and everyone enjoys a music therapy. And it's amazing how a client can be almost asleep and almost unresponsive all day long, and then the music therapy and come in and start singing their songs. We have a lady who was doing something like this, and we thought she was dancing like that. And we talked to her family, and no, she used to play piano. And oh, you know, nice. that music therapy, we would have never known that, you know, until the music therapy came in, and she kind of brightened up and then started playing that piano all over again. So That's wonderful. That's one of our favorite places to go as music therapists. We always... All the students who get to go there to the ADC um, re really love it. And y'all are always so gracious um, and very hospitable. So thank you for having us and putting up with us. Yes, in the very back. What's the question? Oh, it's in the packet. What she say? She wants electronic, electronic version. I'm sure we can make that happen. We will make it happen. I'll get your email address. I'll send it to you. Okay? Okay. Yes, sir? Oh. Yes, sir. What y'all are doing is wonderful. I've been telling us a long time. People die, a lot of things happen, go to the doctor. They don't hear as things as nice as what y'all are doing. Mm-hmm. So it'd be very nice to be able to get in contact with people that can get people out so they have life. We have life, they have life, rather than just close our mouth and we just don't feel good. Thank you very much. Oh, it's our pleasure. And there's so often music therapists get thanked um, from working in hospice for many years. Um, always so much gratitude, and I know Amy hears it all the time at the hospital. But really, the pleasure is all ours. Uh, my life has been incredibly enriched by the people that I get to work with. So you're welcome, but really, thank you. Yes, sir. I uh, really enjoyed seeing uh, 
the Robert Redford Sundowns Festival uh, CD called Alive Inside. Mm. I'm surprised you didn't mention that because it began in one facility, and the last I heard, it was now being utilized in more than 16 music therapy, basically, in more than 1,600 facilities. It's probably up in the thousands now. That was a year ago. But in this Alive Inside, this social work graduate student started uh, filming, videoing his uh, aunt or his mother, and uh, she began to speak more. And as the movie progressive, they've had people who had aphasia for three, four, five years, hasn't, hadn't spoken, and because of music therapy, playing the, the tunes that they loved as uh, young people, and uh, one gentleman spoke after six years of not even speaking. So music therapy is powerful. Alive inside, I recommend it. So, yes, Alive Inside, it's a great program. Um, and I, I'm really glad that that resource is available. Um, and I think that it's a fabulous place to start, and it is a great way for everybody to see how powerful music is. And I know our, um, our governing body, American Music Therapy Association, is trying to partner um, with that company to go into those facilities that have that program. So um, once those patients or those clients are starting to have those responses, then a music therapist can come in and start building on that so they can um, have more rewarding experiences with um, more live and engaging music. But yeah, that is a great, that's a good program. Very good. Yes. Um, based on having watched that video, um, Mm-hmm. for the person and upload it to an iPod shuffle and headphones. And we did that to my husband. And after 40 years of marriage, we being a dancer have not, we danced every day. Every Fantastic. Day. And it was the most calming, mm-hmm. energizing thing for him. He wouldn't want you to take the headset off. And, you know, he would walk around <laughs> And then all of a sudden burst out and bring a fire. It was magic. It was absolute magic. So that's one way when you mm-hmm. can't have a music. Yes. People were in the band hospitals. Mm-hmm. The music therapists were magic. And when he would get agitated and trying to find out the bed, and then he'd come and start playing, it was just. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing and yes. magic. Good. So, I, you know, it made all the difference for us. Good. In probably the last three months of my husband's life was just amazing. Right. Good. Yeah, and that's why, that's why we're trying to partner with that program so we can get into all those facilities where they're starting to provide that um, as a way to build on that to extend on the responses that they're seeing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. So can I ask that we repeat some of the questions and comments when people don't have a mic so that they can go on the video and people can benefit from those later? Yes. Yes. being here at home because a lot of folks mm-hmm. aren't going in a facility. Mm-hmm. And so, absolutely. Yes, so she had asked if we're going to talk more about in the workshop um, how to use music at home, and that is what we're going to be discussing more of, how the caregivers can use um, different aspects of music therapy to um, work on those certain responses like memory and um, emotion and mood and things like that. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's right up your alley. And if so, is it only in a facility? Okay, so sh- her question was, is there, um, is there coverage through insurance for music therapy? All right. So <laughs> this, uh, 
it's kind of all over the place right now in our field. So our ultimate goal is to be able to receive um, reimbursement for our services. And it's already starting in some uh, parts of the field. So when I worked with premature infants at our hospital, we were charging for those services. Insurance was covering for those music therapy services. Um, this area of music therapy, we are still working on getting coverage. There are private practice music therapists that I know of that are somehow, they're doing it, um, and they're all doing it in a little bit different way. And so we're hoping that in the near future, we're going to start having just one answer to this, that yes, there is coverage, and this is how we're doing it. So Yes, but as of right now, the services, um, like if we're going to like adult day center or something like that, they're free through the center. I do know private practice music therapists that do go in the home, and it's um, a private pay situation at that point. So, And I'll say, too, a lot of um, companies like Big Ben Hospice, for example, they just hire their music therapists full time, so there's no additional cost to anybody except the hospice. I think we have about four minutes. Any other questions or great stories? Yes, ma'am. In the stripes. Okay. Th thanks. And this is a great presentation. And so I just, uh, I'm glad to hear that you're going to be doing more about the um, music at home kind of thing. So I just wanted to, to mention a couple of our experiences with that as, as my mom had decreased with dementia. And she was, when we were growing up, very much she would sing with us all the time. So I sort of turned the tables with her and would sing with her, you know, as we would drive in the car and do different things. And um, where you were talking about, you know, speeding up or slowing down to kind of change moods, we had one particular point where she'd had a, a very challenging cognitive decline. And it was, I work outside the home, so that those transition times when I would come home from work were very, very challenging for her. And I'd had piano lessons when I was younger, but didn't stick with them very much. But even with my like elementary first grade um, level of piano playing, I would come home and try to, that's how I would calm her down. We would sing songs, play, I would give her a little instrument. And like you said, sometimes it would be 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes. But until we could calm that mood down, that was so effective to use that music in that transition time. So um, just to encourage folks here too, that um, it's so fabulous that this is a program that, that you guys do, but don't feel like you can't tackle that at home on your own in a very basic way. It's very helpful. I think, too, hearing even live music from a loved one, from even a really familiar voice, um, I don't know what the research is, but I would suggest that that might even have even more benefit than a live voice that was unfamiliar. There's another really great documentary on HBO. It's called The Memory Loss Tapes. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It is available online. Um, so that might be really interesting and valuable to you. 